Porsche's 911 reaches its eighth generation and in 992 series form is bigger, faster, more luxurious and a tad more efficient, just as you'd want. More importantly, it's still the most usable super sports car of its kind, yet somehow also still the most exciting, the most dialed in 911 we've seen to date. Only Porsche knows how. Can its enhancements be delivered though without dilution of the magical experience that served this model line so well for so long? And which 911 will suit you best? Coupe or Cabriolet? Rear or four wheel drive? Business Express or Race Refugee? Here's where we find out. For more than half a century there have been sports cars and then there's been Porsche's 911. Today you simply wouldn't design a high performance model of any kind like this. Engine pitched right back, hung over the rear wheels. Which is exactly why since it first appeared in 1963 there really has been nothing quite like this car. And there probably never will be. Here's the 8th generation 992 series version. Porsche doesn't need to fundamentally change the formula because in its Cayman model it already offers a more conventional performance coupe but it does need to finesse it in the face of growing competition from increasingly desirable high performance alternatives from Jaguar, Mercedes, Maserati and Aston Martin. In short, it does need this rejuvenated 992 series version, available as ever primarily in coupe and cabriolet forms, with most sales based on Carrera series variants like this one, offering a choice of two or four wheel drive derivatives. Uh, despite what the exterior looks might suggest, this is a lot more than simply an evolved 991 series car. Uh, we already had that back in 2014 when that previous Mark 7 model got an update package and an all turbo engine lineup. So yes, what we have here is pretty much completely new. Although it doesn't feel like the kind of completely fresh direction in 911 model development that characterized some previous models. Uh, it's 2012 era predecessor, for example, or say the 996 series model of 1998. The mainstream engines are basically carried over from the revised version of the 991, albeit with more power. And the wheelbase length is the same as the car that this one replaces too. To be fair though, not much else is replicated. Uh, the subtle exterior redesign clothes a body that's lighter and stiffer thanks to a doubling of its aluminium content. Plus there's a new 8-speed PDK Auto gearbox, a higher class cabin, uh, redesigned suspension, even better brakes and for the first time different sized wheels front to rear on mainstream models. Plus, as you'll see in this film, you get a lot more technology, including a clever new wet mode, which adapts the drive dynamics to suit slippery conditions. Will it all be enough to allow this car to reclaim an undisputed position as the sharpest driving tool in Porsche's lineup? And will people who've waited all their lives to own one of these feel that they've missed the chance to have a real one? It's a tough brief for the most ambitious 911 that Stuttgart's ever made. Let's put it to the test. So to the 911 experience, quite simply there's no other car in the world that makes us feel as confident behind the wheel. Now it could be down to the ideal driving position, this perfectly supportive seat, or the way that the extremities of the car are so easy to place, despite the fact that this 992 series model places you five millimeters closer to the tarmac than its predecessor did. Or it could be a combination of all that mixed with the adrenaline that goes with the drive in any legendary sports car. Now we've tested almost every generation of 911 and each time we try a new one there's the same sense of excitement and adrenaline from the moment the flat six out back is gunned into action. And that's something that's now done with a twist of this fascia switch. 
Now, unless you're upgrading from one of the last of the previous 991 series models, you might need updating on the fact that the engines on the mainstream 911s are turbocharged these days, although the aural fireworks aren't really much different. Uh, there's still that guttural flat six roar that flares briefly and then settles down to the usual pulsing beat. You're ready to go. Very quickly as it happens, so it's just as well that the four piston brakes, as ever, are brilliant, even if you don't go for the pricey ceramic ones. Now here we're focusing on the first two rungs of the 911 Performance Ladder, the Carrera and the Carrera S, each model more powerful than it was before, thanks to reworked symmetrical twin turbos, piezo electric fuel injection, uh, larger intercoolers and a host of other revisions made to the three litre units that both brands use. Uh, this power plant is virtually as responsive as the brand's older, normally aspirated 3.4 and 3.8 litre sixes, thanks to a clever design that uses specially selected compressor wheels within the turbines. Now, this virtually eliminates the usual slight delay in throttle response that used to characterise turbo units, with the result that this one just pulls like a train in almost any gear. You could perhaps argue whether this engine really has the mid-range spine-tingling character that you'd want from a 911. It's not brash like an AMG V8 or shrill when revving out like an Italian V8, but it certainly serves up plenty of orchestral fireworks. It embellishes your progress with whooshing turbines, fluttering wastegates and sonorous roars. It also brings an almost supercar style level of pulling power to the party, 450 newton meters if you're interested in the case of the base Carrera model which now puts out 385 PS, that's 15 PS more than before. Uh, most will want one of the Carrera S variants, we're trying one of those here, which are also tuned for more power, developing 530 newton meters of torque and 450 PS. That's that's 30 PS more than before. These increases compensate for a 55 kilo weight increase this time around, and that ensures that the quoted sprint times can still be a fraction quicker, 4.2 seconds in the case of the Carrera Coupe, or 3.7 seconds in the case of a Carrera S Coupe. Add a couple of tenths to those figures if you want the slightly heavier Cabriolet body style, and whatever body shape you choose, uh, you can take a couple of tenths off of the uh, standard quoted acceleration times by opting for the extra cost sport chrono package which builds in launch control to the new PDK Auto gearbox. Now it's new because it now has eight speeds, previously there were seven, and it now features a quick shift feature like that used in the GT3 for super fast ratio changes at high engine revs and loads. Now Porsche has stuck with seven speeds for the optional manual stick shift that laudably and uniquely in this segment the brand continues to offer for the tiny minority of buyers who will want that. As before, there are also all-wheel drive Carrera 4 and Carrera 4S models with extra traction that skims a tenth from the sprint time, which means, for instance, that a Carrera 4S Coupe PDK Sport Chrono model like this one uh, that we're driving today will flash past 62 miles an hour in just 3.4 seconds. It does too. We've tried it. Ultimately though, uh, tyre smoking drag strip stats in a super sports car like this one are about as relevant to the real world driving experience as the top speed figures, which uh, depending on Carrera series variant vary between 180 and 191 miles an hour since you asked. Uh, but we've given you those stats to make the point that although this 992 series model has become slightly bigger and heavier than its predecessor, you needn't doubt that it really is properly fast. As quick in Carrera S form as the old GTS model was and only 25 PS off the previous 991 series track tune GT3 plus a 992 generation car is five seconds quicker than an equivalent version of the previous generation 991 model around their classic Nürburgring Nordschleife racetrack. If you know your 911s, all of that will mean a lot. But let's say you don't. Let's say you're not coming to this car after years of enthusiasm for this model's bloodline, but after owning uh, or testing a direct super sport segment rival, maybe an Audi R8, an Aston Martin Vantage, or a Mercedes-AMG GT. What will you notice? 
well, firstly, perhaps the fact that this 911 is less extrovert than cars like that, not only in the way that it looks and sounds, but also in the way that in its uh, normal drive mode setting, it's so easy going and untroubled. Uh, you sit higher, visibility is better, and refinements in a different class because the engine, which is sat out back rather than up front, isn't constantly trying to remind you of its prodigious power. It's everyday friendly in a way that its competitors simply aren't. But be in no doubt, the super sports car genes are very much in there. When the time's right, the road opens up and you're able to plant your right foot while selecting one of the sport drive settings. The car simply lunges towards the horizon with the best of the twin turbo units pulling power developed between 2,300 and 5,000 RPM. As before, as part of the optional sport chrono packages, uh, steering wheel mounted drive mode controller, you get a sport response button, which um, preconditions the drivetrain for maximum acceleration over 20 seconds for swift overtaking. And on all Carrera Series models, there's an adaptive rear spoiler that deploys at 56 miles an hour into the first of three positions that aims to keep the rear of the car pinned to the tarmac. All well and good, but every car in this segment is frantically fast. None of them, though, feel quite the same as a 911 when you're tacking the turns, uh, radically changing the way that weight's distributed in a car of this kind, radically changes its cornering demeanor too. As always, this 911 feels uniquely center pivoted, responding to wheel and pedal movements with an immediacy that's just a bit more driver centric than it is in the very impressive competitors that we just mentioned. Uh, you sense a greater feeling of confidence and control, particularly right at the edge of adhesion. And the whole experience is even more complete and satisfying this time around. It's instructive to examine the reasons why. Uh, the steering rack of this 992 series model is now 11% quicker, the front track width is 45 millimeters wider, and the wheels, now unequally sized, bigger at the back, are a size larger than before, with a mix of 20 and 21 inch rims on this S series version. Plus, dynamic engine mounts, which minimize vibrations in the drivetrain and are standard across the range. A few years back, uh, Porsche also standardized its PASM, that's the Porsche Adaptive Suspension Management, adaptive damping uh, on this car, which offers a choice of either normal or sport settings, and which has now been improved. Uh, now, although the basic multi-link rear suspension setup has largely been carried over from the previous model, its PASM electronics have been adjusted to work in either bounce or rebound while the damper is moving rather than only when it's static, which of course means that it can react more quickly to changing surfaces. As usual on a 911, the PASM activation can be separated out from the usual drive modes that vary steering feel, throttle response, exhaust note, uh, stability status, and on the PDK variants, gear change timings. As usual on a Porsche, you're offered normal Sport and Sport Plus drive selections, along with an individual option that allows you to quickly personalize all these settings in the same way that, uh, say, a DTM champion might set up his race car. Porsche Torque Vectoring, uh, PTV, which selectively breaks the inside rear wheel through sharp bends, is these days standard on all Carrera Series models too. And if you choose to pair PTV with the all-wheel drive system that shunts power between the axles so it's always serving the wheels that need it most, uh, the result is quite astonishing corner-to-corner -corner traction. Uh, but there is just a chance that on this 992 series model you may not feel the need to pay extra for Carrera 4 or Carrera 4S traction and that is because of the standard inclusion on all versions of this 8th generation design of what Porsche calls a wet mode. Now this is primarily designed to reduce the risk of aquaplaning on damp roads. Um, it's a bit like the slippery setting that you get on uh, some Mercedes AMG models but in that case you have to judge when a selection might be appropriate. On this 911, acoustic sensors behind the front wheel arches do that job for you. Uh, they suggest wet mode activation when road surface spray goes beyond a certain threshold. 
activate this setting and throttle response is flatter and the traction, PASM adaptive damping and adaptive aero systems all join in to help the car better stick to the road. Also helping here is the addition in this car of the so-called Swarm Intelligence, which is continually guarded from other Porsches in the area that you're driving in and which will, if necessary, alert you to potential driving hazards, uh, flooding and aquaplaning amongst them. More effective handling stability in all conditions can be delivered in Carrera S-Series models by optioning in two key dynamic extras, uh, which have to be ordered together, uh, and they've been carried over from the latest versions of the previous 991 series model. Uh, PDCC, or Porsche Dynamic Chassis Control, is an active roll compensation system that detects the very instant that this Porsche begins to roll when it's cornering and eliminates it almost completely. Hit a bump mid-corner and the car just shrugs it off and continues on as if nothing's happened. It's almost eerie. Now the other key dynamic option that you could add into an S is active rear axle steering and that's been adapted from Porsche's 911 GT3 race car for road use. Now this feature offers you a more direct feeling of corner turning and it also improves high speed stability in situations like emergency lane changes. Now a side benefit of that system is that it reduces the turning circle by half a metre to 10.6 metres and that's something that you'll really appreciate when you're manoeuvring in packed city streets. Ah yes, now urban use. As we suggested earlier, this car feels more high street friendly than its obvious super sport segment rivals, but you would still benefit from the optional front axle lift system that raises the nose of the car by 40 millimeters at speeds of up to 21 miles an hour. That helps you to clear speed bumps more easily, uh, particularly if, as here, your Carrera S model has been fitted with 10 millimeter lowered PASM sport suspension. Uh, for frequent town travel, you might also want to specify the Power Steering Plus option, which offers a variable low speed ratio for easier parking and manoeuvring. Uh, for normal driving beyond the city limits, uh, you'll benefit from the optional LED matrix headlights that we've been trying here, uh, which adapt 84 individual LEDs into each headlamp unit to precisely direct exactly the right beam in exactly the right place. What about highway use? Well, in keeping with the remit that has to see this model fit for purpose as a grand touring GT, as well as an out-and-out -out sports car, Porsche has improved high-speed refinement this time around. Tire roar has been particularly improved. Uh, but other rivals still do the whole GT thing better uh, and more quietly, if that's ultimately all you really want. The brand does at least now allow you to option in an adaptive cruise control system, which can slow the car right down to a stop and then seamlessly start it off again if you come across the tailback. But that is really about it in terms of any kind of semi-autonomous driving tech. Rivals have gone much further in this regard and we'd expected that as part of the Volkswagen Group, Zuffenhausen would have been offered access to these kinds of options too. Uh, for the time being though, it seems not. But then the whole point of a 911 lies in the enjoyment, not the automation of the driving experience. Uh, try one and you'll begin to understand just why this Porsche has such a following. There's a feeling of involvement on offer here, only otherwise delivered by the kind of uncompromising track-orientated sports car that you just couldn't use every day. This model is superb on a circuit too, and if you're a track day fan, you'll love its new Porsche Track Precision app, which helps to refine your lap times. But unlike most rivals, it's equally at home if all that's required is collection of your dry cleaning. Time and again, brand enthusiasts have worried that the necessary changes will dilute the 911 experience. Uh, the switch to water-cooled engines in 98, uh, the move to electric steering in 2012, the adoption of twin-turbo technology for Carrera models in 2015. None of it, though, changed the essential appeal of this car, and hopefully nothing ever will. It's easy to assume that the styling team for the 911 has the easiest job in the world. After all, essentially the same shape has been used ever since the car was originally launched back in 1963, and that continuity is a big part of its appeal. 
Actually, the 911 has changed hugely over the decades. This 992 series version is a huge 229 millimeters longer than the 60s original, while also being 20 millimeters longer and 45 millimeters wider at the front than its 991 series predecessor. This is, in other words, no longer the compact, darted little sports car you might remember admiring when you were growing up, and it hasn't been for some time. It is still smaller than some of its direct rivals, though. As you might notice from a profile perspective, if you happen on this Porsche at a gathering of luxury GT Super Sports cars, this particular model is 11 millimeters shorter than a McLaren 540C and 25 mil shorter than a Mercedes-AMG GT. You'd know the classic silhouette at a glance, of course, but if you weren't a 911 brand loyalist, you might not necessarily notice the changes that designate this eighth generation model. For admirers of this car though they'll be uber significant uh, the door mirrors have been redesigned and aerodynamically enhanced to reduce wind noise and to visually lower the center of gravity this bottom sill line has now been separated from the base of the door aperture and it flows between wheel arches that for the first time on a mainstream production 911 house different rim sizes you have 20 inch alloys at the front uh, with 21 inches at the back uh, the alloys sport red brake calipers and they are here optionally embellished with satin black paint. Here, as you can see, we've got the coupe. There's also an alternative cabriolet body style with a canvas hood that can be raised or lowered in only 12 seconds. And as usual, Porsche has also developed an interim Targa body style too. At the front, the 992 series updates are easier to spot. The lower section of the nose is more horizontally orientated. It emphasizes the 46 millimeter of extra front track width, which has sharpened up the handling, but there's now rather an expanse of black plastic across the uh, larger intakes, which is arguably less elegant than before. Uh, larger active aerodynamic cooling flaps in that area stay closed until you reach 93 miles an hour, ensuring optimum airflow resistance. The bonnet line is completely different. It's now lower and more angular at the corners in a nod to the classic G series 911 of 73, the car that really popularized this Porsche as an enthusiast's favorite. And and the headlamps have changed too. Uh, they're still round and seamlessly integrated into the wings, of course, in classic 911 style, but they're now narrower with full LED beams as standard. Many owners will upgrade these to the intelligent matrix lamps fitted here, which use so-called Excite technology with laser light style beams, courtesy of 84 individual LEDs that work together, masking oncoming traffic while simultaneously increasing illumination in your own lane. Uh, the rear changes have been the most controversial ones. The biggest difference actually isn't this full-width lighting strip, which is becoming fashionable amongst the so-called experts to dislike. Uh, it actually lies in the fact that it's now not possible to have the old classic narrow rear bodywork on rear-driven Carrera models, which some of the cognoscenti think is rather a pity. Now, Porsche say that almost everyone wanted this wide-bodied look anyway, so they thought they might as well standardise it. As before, this smoothly sculpted tail section incorporates an adaptive rear spoiler, which rises at above 56 miles an hour into the first of three positions that depend on the driving situation and on your chosen driving mode. Uh, the vertically arranged louvres of this air intake offer a visual point of differentiation for the drive shaft count. Uh, they're black slatted for the rear driven models and silver slatted for Carrera 4 variants like this one. And from back here, you'll also be able to visually determine the 911 model in question's exhaust status. These two oval outlets designate the fitment of the optional sports exhaust. Uh, the standard system has two double tailpipes. Arguably more important than any of this is what now lies beneath the voluptuous panelwork. It seems strange to remember that as recently as the 997 series model, just two generations ago, 911s were completely crafted from old-fashioned galvanized steel. These days, apart from the front and rear aprons, the outer skin is entirely made of aluminium. And because of the use of uh, double the amount of that light, strong metal in this eighth generation model, 12 kilos has been saved. And that's a useful result, but it's not enough to prevent an overall weight increase of 55 kilos this time 
time around. Hence the need for the horsepower increases which have been visited on the twin turbo straight six in order to maintain an optimum power to weight ratio, which is actually uh, the highest that it's ever been in a standard 911. Enough. Uh, we may have had to drill down into the detail to cover the exterior updates to this car, but even someone with a mere passing acquaintance with 911 models will be able to appreciate the changes made in the cabin. Uh, these power-operated door handles spring out to allow you to enter. Cognoscenti didn't like those either. This, as you can see, has entered the digital age, which is slightly at odds with the reversion to horizontal fascia styling, uh, which characterised the old F and G series 70s models. Just as it did in the very first 911, the dashboard now flows in an unbroken span across the entire width of the interior, and it now feels luxurious, contemporary, and extremely stylish. The cabin design of previous 911s was always smarter than that you'd find in an enthusiast sports car, but not quite smart enough to interest someone wanting a super luxury sports GT. Now there's absolutely no question of this interior's luxury credentials. The ambiance is all double-stitched leather, uh, beautiful workmanship and faultless, faultless fit and finish. Not everyone likes it, of course. For some, what's been achieved here is a less than ideal compromise between the uh, space age cockpit of a Mark II model Panamera and the analog usability that characterized 911s of yore. But whatever your point of view, what it all boils down to is a layout that's more advanced than what you get in an Audi R8, more logical than an Aston Vantage, and which is easier to get to grips with than any AMG GT or McLaren. Yes, the feel isn't as exotic or as focused as the kind of thing that you get in any of those competitors. And in some ways, yes, that is disappointing. Sometimes you want a car like this to feel like a racer. In other ways, though, it isn't. Uh, the all-round visibility and driving ergonomics are so much better here than is the case with those four key rivals we just mentioned, which is why you'll use this 911 for the sort of uh, commuting or shopping journey that you just wouldn't bother undertaking at the wheel of a lower-slung super sports car, which in turn means that you'll enjoy owning it all the more. So let's get to grips with this new era interface. Through the grippy three-spoke wheel, which is also new, lies a defiantly analog central rev counter, without which a Porsche simply wouldn't be a Porsche. But the two seven-inch readouts uh, that sit either side of it are actually configurable freeform displays. Now, unfortunately, the two outer ones for temperature and fuel on the right and for the analog clock on the left are obscured by the wheel rim, which isn't great, but it is neat how easy you can customize what appears in the two immediate left and right hand screens around the analog dial by using uh, this button on the right hand steering wheel spoke. Uh, now you can't do an awful lot with the left hand gauge, uh, a speedometer into which you can add navigation and speed limit info, but the right hand trip computer area is multi-configurable. Um, its options include readouts for g-forces, for tyre pressures, drive settings, uh, a trip computer and a screen with fuel, temperature, turbo boost and battery voltage data. Uh, Carrera 4 models add a drive distribution layout and if you have optioned in the Sport Chrono Pack you'll also get a selectable lap timer. Now that uh, functionality is replicated by this central analog gauge at the top of the dash. Just about everything else you need to know is covered off by this generously sized 10.9 inch flush mounted Porsche communication management touchscreen display in the center of the dash. Uh, before 2014, you had to pay extra to get any sort of credible infotainment monitor in a 911. Uh, these days, though, the whole cabin interface is built around it. Uh, PCM now deals with many of the functions that you used to have to fish around to find in the instrument cluster. It's a very complete setup, which goes some way towards compensating for Porsche's strange refusal to offer any kind of head-up display in this car. 
Uh, this monitor is, of course, also multi-configurable. Now, the home screen here is based around uh, personalizable tiles, which you can move about rather like files on a desktop screen of a PC. Uh, here, for example, we happen to have chosen to prioritize radio, drive modes, uh, exhaust settings, weather and phone status, plus the current time, of course, since it's so hard to see it in the instrument cluster. Uh, and there's also a small navigation view segment. Uh, there's uh, pinch and swipe functionality, as you'd expect, plus there's a very good voice control system, and there are manual dials for volume and upper screen functionality. But we would still rather also have the kind of uh, lower console controller that you'd find on a rival R8 or AMG GT. Two options on the left and right of the screen allow you to drill deeper into PCM. A left-hand arrow opens up the climate control functions, while on the right, uh, shortcut keys inset into the driver's side of the screen offer up nav, uh, media, phone, car, uh, climate, apps, assist and sound options. Uh, phone functionality is enhanced by standard Apple CarPlay mirroring and the apps section is particularly useful. It gives you news, weather um, and online search function and locational info on hotels, parking spaces, uh, petrol stations and restaurants. But it's the car screen that you'll be using most to select your preferred driving settings, uh, chassis setup and the state of exhaust note and spoiler level all of it delivered with glorious graphical clarity. Uh, once you've dialed in your preferences, you can then save them as a bespoke setting by pressing the individual button and then gain a one-touch access to the drive package that you've put together by using the provided toggle switch favorite buttons, which are part of the row of five smart toggle switches that sit below the infotainment screen and uh, feature a lovely knurled metal finish. Now we could go on and on about infotainment and connectivity here by talking about things like the new Track Precision and Road Trip Porsche apps, uh, the Swarm data system that enhances navigation and which briefs you on hazards ahead, the extra cost military style night vision assist camera package, uh, the thumping optional Bose and Burmester audio setups, and the fact that this car is permanently online thanks to its integrated LTE compatible SIM card, which makes possible features like Radio Plus, an online radio system that seamlessly cuts in if, when you're listening to a station, you leave the range for terrestrial FM or DAB reception. But we won't do any of that because there's lots else of even greater importance to brief you on. Uh, the seats, for example, which have been uh, completely revamped with lightweight construction, they now place you five millimeters closer to terra firma and they're even more supportive with a wider base cushion and a backrest that's 20 millimeters higher. Four-way electric adjustment is standard, but we would recommend that you consider an upgrade to the full 14-way adjustment package, and that includes lumbar support and a memory function. Uh, either way, these chairs position you perfectly for the main controls in a way that, uh, as we referenced earlier, makes you feel instantly at home as soon as you get behind the wheel here. The seats slide back a long way. There are perfectly placed pedals. It's all good. And some of those main controls are very different this time around. Uh, there's no slot into which you can insert the car-shaped key, for example, because a keyless entry and start switch system has now been standardized. Uh, you have to click this controller just here to the right of the steering column. This isn't a particularly tactile fitting, nor is the new auto gear stick. It's now much smaller, perhaps too small for the importance of its function. And while we're griping about fixtures and fittings, uh, the steering wheel spoke mounted drive mode dial that you get with the Sport Chrono Pack, that still feels like something that you buy in Lidl. Uh, on the plus side, uh, as part of the interior rethink, Porsche has ensured that your attention can be uh, drawn away from fitments of this sort by allowing buyers to specify different color themed interiors. Now we have the truffle brown club leather package here and also by restructuring the dash and the door architecture with special inlay areas. Now this mid-level trimming strip for example that can be personalized with uh, expensive feeling inlays. Typically aluminium is here but there's even uh, traditional wood veneer if you want that. 
uh, you might want to look at one of these options as uh, well an alternative to the shiny piano black trimming that's used for this uh, now wider lower center console panel the motor industry is fascinated with this stuff uh, we simply find it very difficult to keep looking pristine in actual ownership it uh, smears and scratches so easily as always in the 911, all-round visibility is, as we remarked a few moments ago, of a completely different order to anything you'd find in any other super sports car. Uh, the classically distinctive bulges around the headlamps give you a clear idea as to where the front wheels are, uh, and that makes car park manoeuvring uh, considerably easier than it would be in a lower slung rival. Uh, the slim windscreen pillars mean that your front three quarter view isn't impeded at junctions, um, and even your rearward perspective is pretty good. It's better in fact than on some family hatches thanks to the deep rear window that allows you to place the back of the car there accurately. It all means that the kind of um, surround view camera system which is virtually obligatory to avoid expensive urban scrapes on direct rivals isn't really necessary on a 911 although we do have it here along with a standard fit set of all-round parking sensors. Cabin storage on a sports car is never going to be exemplary, and it isn't here. Uh, commentators have moaned about the deletion this time around of the twin cup holders that on the previous models used to pop out below the glove box, uh, but we always found them a bit of a stretch. Uh, perhaps they were better, though, than this rather ugly single holder inserted instead between the seats, which gets in the way of the electronic handbrake switch and the pop-out holder on the far end of the dash. Porsche says that it's redesigned the door pockets, but they're still so narrow as to be only any good for the storage of things you've recently run over. Uh, the supplementary rear bin, though, might be useful for smaller items. A shallow lidded box between the seats houses twin USBs plus SIM and SD card ports. Uh, there is a reasonably sized glove box and there are ticker clips on the sun visors. Now, with most rival super sports cars, Audi's R8, Aston Martin's Vantage, uh, the Mercedes-AMG GT and McLaren's 540C, for example, this is where we'd be finishing our tour of the cabin. But the 911 has its reputation as the most practical model in the class to uphold, hence the continued inclusion of the two small rear seats that you'd have to do without in the brand 718 Cayman and Boxster models. You get them with the Cabriolet Body Style 2. It's yet another thing that makes this car so usable. Now you tug on these lovely little stitched seat side straps to full forward the backs. Uh, bear in mind though that unless you've splashed out on optional full electric adjustment for these front chairs, you'll have to return them to their original position manually after you've moved them forward uh, to allow the rear passengers in. And once inside, well, it's predictably very cramped back here, but you would put up with it in preference to a rainy walk back from the pub, and two small children would be uh, fine over relatively short distances. Now, Porsche says uh, that they've redesigned these rear pews with a wider seat cushion, a backrest that's 20 millimeters higher, but they still leave you in an uncomfortably upright position. And of course, there's next to no legroom. Still, you could uh, barter with folk up front to help you there. Uh, not an awful lot can be done though about the crippling lack of headroom. This car may be four millimeters taller in 992 series, guys, but as an adult sat back here, you'd still have to be very short to avoid bashing your head against the roof lining. All of which means you'll mainly be pressing these rear chairs into service for the carriage of jackets and designer shopping bags, or kids, of course. Um, if it's your weekend to have the grandchildren, then you'll be very pleased to find that a child seat will just about fit into the ice fix mountings that are provided either side of the transmission tunnel. The seat back split and fold down flat, which allows you to carry uh, longer items of luggage, a set of golf clubs, for example. 
having this extra space for potential bag stowage is important given that, as with any super sports car, uh, trunk space is at a bit of a premium. Now, the mid-engine configuration of Porsche's 718 Boxster and Cayman models frees up space for a rear boot compartment, but of course, uh, with this twin turbo 3 litre 6 slung out the back here, you don't get that with a 911, just this uh, little flap here that rises to reveal an engine plaque and access to various service reservoirs. That means that anything that you can't fit inside therefore has to go in this compartment uh, beneath the sculpted bonnet. Now this is now 132 litres in size, regardless of your chosen 911's rear driven or four wheel drive status. That's 13 litres less than you got on the previous generation Carrera, but seven litres more than was offered by the previous Carrera 4. Either way, it's not very big. Uh, a front engine rival like a Vantage or an AMG GT will give you vastly more luggage room. Still, at least this area is at least quite deep, which means that it's large enough to swallow a typical carry-on flight case, perhaps a couple of softer bags or maybe the proceeds from a mid-level supermarket excursion. Plus, loading is uh, easy because the nose is quite low. Uh, tucked into this LED-lit space is an emergency warning triangle and a get your home puncture repair kit. Ultimately though, uh, you really can't make the most of what's on offer here uh, unless you pay extra for the tailored 911 luggage set. Is a 911 good value for money? Well, that depends on your perspective. There'll always be lesser brands offering sports cars that look similarly quick, but there's something about the depth of engineering and the history of this car that sets it apart. So let's run you through the pricing proposition delivered by the various Carrera series models. Uh, the 992 series range was priced from launch from around £83,000 for a base rear-driven 385 PS Carrera Coupe, and it runs to just over £108,000 for a 450 50 PS Carrera 4S Cabriolet. The individual model list prices will quote you. Assume that you'll be ordering your 911 with the 8-speed PDK Auto Paddle Shift gearbox that almost all buyers want. But if you really are of an old school mindset and you want a manual, you can talk to your Porsche Center about the 7-speed stick shift that'll save you a fraction. Take a closer look at the volume variants on offer and the essential story is that your basic choice is between standard Carrera variants with 385 PS and Carrera S models like this one with 450 PS. Either way, all-wheel drive Carrera 4 or Carrera 4S variants are offered at a premium of around £5,500 over their rear-driven versions. And as usual, uh, regardless of your selected drive layout, you can choose between either coupe or cabriolet body styles. As we've just suggested, the standard rear-driven Carrera Coupe kicks off at around £83,000 and you'll need around £10,000 more for the Cabriolet version. If you simply have to have the extra power of a Carrera S, then there's a premium of around £10,500 to find over the standard model. And there's the same increment for a Cabriolet as with the base model. Now let's get some Porsche range perspective on all that. Now the price we just quoted for a base Carrera Coupe with the 385 PS version of the 3 litre uh, flat 6 twin turbo engine means that you're looking at having to find around £30,000 more than you'd have to spend to get yourself the next model down in the Porsche hierarchy. The comparably performing 350 PS 4 cylinder 718 Cayman S. Now that might take a bit of thinking about. Uh, go for a base 911 Carrera with the Cabriolet body style and the increment over the equivalent four-cylinder 718 series model, the open top Boxster, that would be even greater, around 37,000 pounds. Mm. Of course, uh, 911 ownership doesn't begin and end with the Carrera series models. As with the previous 991 series 911, uh, the 992 generation will include an additional Targa body style with lift-out roof panels and even faster GTS Coupe and Cabriolet models, along with the GT3 and GT3 RS Coupe variants plus the four-wheel drive turbo and turbo S Coupe and Cabriolet derivatives. So, lottery winners can uh, form an orderly queue. So now you know your 911s, if you didn't already. Uh, what about the value proposition compared to obvious rivals, though? 
Well, in terms of the various Carrera Series variants, the cars that we always used to mention as close alternatives were Audi's R8 and Aston Martin's Vantage. In more recent times, though, both those contenders have been uh, redesigned and moved up a class above Carrera Series ownership, although in real terms, they're still really no faster than a Carrera S model like the one we have here. Uh, take the R8. Uh, today's revised Mark II version only comes with a V10 developing either 570 or 620 PS and a starting price tag of around £130,000. As for the Aston, well, that comes only in a single V8 form, developing 510 PS, and it costs from around £120,000. Either way, you're looking at cars pitched more to compete with a 911 Turbo than any sort of 911 Carrera. The same, by the way, is true of the 540 PS McLaren 540C, which costs around £137,000. And no, that isn't much faster than a Carrera S either. Which leaves, well, what to take on this car in the 90 to 110,000 pound lower order super sports car segment? Well, nothing really that's quite the same. A Mercedes AMG GT probably represents the closest alternative. In base form, it offers 482 PS from a 4 litre V8 at a price which at the time of this test was around 104,000 pounds for the coupe version. So about 11,000 pounds more than a Carrera S. But the front engine feel of that Falterback engineered model certainly won't satisfy a 911 loyalist. What else? Well, a Nissan GTR is a little quicker, but it's no longer much cheaper. It'll cost you far more to run and it'll depreciate rapidly. A V8 supercharged Jaguar F Type SVR is another option, but it costs £20,000 more than a Carrera S, which you might find rather hard to swallow given that the prodigious weight of that Jag's 5 litre engine means that the top. F-Type is really no quicker, despite an extra 125 PS of power. For completion, uh, let's also tell you that around £95,000 would buy you a Maserati Gran Turismo with 466 PS. 100000 would get you a BMW M850i xDrive Coupe with 538 PS. And 119000 would buy you a Mercedes-AMG SL63 with 579 PS. In all three cases, though, you'd be getting more of a Grand Tourer than a really fearsome sports car. Enough though with spec and comparisons. Let's say that you've decided nothing but a 911 will do. Now if having done that, you were to turn to the spec sheet and then find it necessary to have to spend a fortune on the kind of extra cost features that you'd expect for a six figure outlay, we could understand how you'd be left feeling frustrated. Now that was often the case previously when it came to 911 ownership, but is it still true here? Well, let's find out. Now, at first glance, uh, things do seem promising. The equipment levels are pretty much the same, regardless of your choice between Carrera or Carrera S models. Uh, the only real spec difference, uh, apart from the S model's increase in power, of course, is that the 385 PS Carrera model gets 19 inch wheels at the front and 20 inches at the rear, while this 450 PS Carrera S gets 20 inch wheels at the front and 21 inches at the rear. Either way, big red four piston brake calipers with cross-drilled 350mm discs are fitted. So let's get into what Carrera Series spec gives you. Full LED headlamps are fitted as standard this time around, along with LED rear lamps and, as usual, an auto-deploying rear spoiler. As you'd expect on a super sports car, there is also a driving mode system that primarily tweaks steering feel, throttle response and gear change timings with normal, sport and sport plus options, along with a new wet mode that can adapt the behaviour of the car to better suit rainy or icy conditions. And there's an individual option too, so you can personalise your own preferences. Now these driving modes also tweak the damping, and that's thanks to the fact that the brand's PASM, that's Porsche Adaptive Suspension Management System, System, uh, with its choice of either normal or sport modes is now standard on all models. Uh, it wasn't long ago that you had to pay a lot more for leather upholstery too, but that's now standard as well. Uh, you can choose between various hide colours. The standard ones are black, slate grey, graphite blue or bordeaux red, along with various company stitching themes at no extra cost. And the front sport seats feature four-way electric adjustment for both rake and height. Uh, another feature that was once listed as a pricey extra, but these days is fitted as standard, is the Central Dash PCM, Porsche Communication Management Infotainment Monitor. 
You can pinch, swipe and tap its 10.9 inch touchscreen to access satellite navigation with real-time traffic updates and a DAB audio system with eight speakers and a 150 watt output. Uh, the PCM setup includes 3D navigation and Bluetooth plus their standard Apple CarPlay smartphone mirroring, although annoyingly not Android Auto. As for other standard 911 features, well, front seat heating and cruise control are now at last included as standard, and all variants get the two 7-inch TFT displays either side of the rev counter. Also, two-zone automatic climate control, park assist, front and rear parking sensors, and green-tinted thermally insulated glass. In addition, as with all the brand's models, new buyers get a complimentary driving course at the company's Experience Center at Silverstone. You get some really clever connectivity technology too. There are Car Finder and Porsche Vehicle Tracking System Plus services that let you know where your 911 is at all times. Uh, the navigation system is able to process so-called swarm data via its risk radar service, which anonymously captures data about traffic and road conditions from vehicles with relevant equipment. Uh, that could mean that your 911 will know in advance about fog, skidding risks and road accidents, uh, adapting its systems and navigational inputs accordingly. Uh, there are also a range of downloadable bespoke apps available for this car. Uh, now, the main one that you'll be using is the Porsche Connect app. Now, that works on both Apple and Android phones, and it gives you a wide variety of digital features and services. It includes a remote vehicle status feature via which you'll be able to check vital data such as door locking and fuel range from your handset. This Connect app is divided into three main areas. My vehicle for car specific functions, me for user specific services and navigation which allows you to find destinations of almost any kind in seconds. Uh, a covered car park rather than an open one for example if it's pouring down and you don't want to step out into the rain. Uh, beyond Porsche Connect there are also a range of further bespoke apps available for this car. Uh, now we particularly like the Porsche Road Trip app which helps on long distance journeys. On to options. Uh, we'd certainly also want this car's sports exhaust system. That's available with standard all black finishes. And like most 911 buyers, we'd pay extra for the Sport Chrono Package 2. And this adds an individual mode for personal selection of a range of sporty vehicle settings, along with dynamic engine mounts and a center dash stopwatch. Plus, you get use of the Porsche Track Precision app that allows detailed recording, display and analysis of circuit driving data on your smartphone. In addition, if you've opted for a PDK automatic model, uh, the Sport Chrono option also gives you launch control, plus a provided steering wheel mounted mode switch will feature a sport response button that preconditions uh, the drivetrain for maximum acceleration over 20 seconds for swift overtaking. That'll be jolly nice to have, especially for track day fiends who will want to consider the very very pricey Porsche carbon ceramic brakes for the ultimate in stopping power. A set of those is nearly £7,000 more though. What else? Um, well, a near essential option on this car in our view is the extra cost front axle lift system that jacks up the body by 40 millimeters to help it over speed bumps at speeds up to 21 miles an hour. Urban based owners will also be interested in the power steering plus feature that lessens the effort needed to turn the wheel at low speeds or when parking. If you stretch to a Carrera S, then you'll be able to pay extra for Porsche dynamic chassis control to reduce body roll in corners. Uh, that's a package that has to be ordered along with the brand's clever rear axle steering system which helps the car to turn into bends more crisply and also comes with the useful side effect of being able to reduce the turning circle by half a meter. S-level buyers will also get uh, to option in 10 millimeter lowered PASM sport suspension. Now, lighting is an important thing to get right. There's a PDLS Plus Porsche Dynamic Light System Plus package, which offers speed-sensitive headlight range control, adapting your headlights to road and weather conditions. And with this car, that setup has been further upgraded to LED matrix status, where the laser-like Excite beam is made up of 84 individual LEDs that work together, reacting to vehicle conditions, camera data, and navigation data. 
As for other things, well, almost unbelievably, you have to pay extra for a rear wiper and a reversing camera. And the Porsche entry and drive keyless entry package, that really ought to be standard too. Uh, you can specify a surround view camera system, a cabin air ionizer, a fire extinguisher, and automatically dimming mirrors with an integrated rain sensor. And we would also want to take up the option Porsche offers of personally collecting your car from the factory. We'd like to look at one of the optional 12-speaker audio packages too, possibly the 570-watt Bose setup, but ideally the high-end Burmester system we've been trying here, which puts out a thumping 855 watts. Uh, you'll also need to get your seat spec right. There are two types of front chair, the standard sports seats or the optional sports seats plus design. Uh, the ordinary sports seats can be embellished at vast extra cost with 14-way electric adjustment and memory settings. And the sports seats plus Plus design can be upgraded to even pricier adaptive status that gives you 18-way adjustment, more prominent side bolsters and memory settings as part of a package that also includes powered steering column movement. Uh, whatever your choice of front chair, cooled seat ventilation can also be optionally added in. On to aesthetics, uh, let's start with the main bodywork colour. If you don't like the basic white, yellow, red or black paint choices, uh, you're going to want to peruse the wide range of metallic options. We've got Dolomite Silver Metallic here. Uh, Porsche has also introduced a number of brighter shades in recent times for those who really want to stand out. Uh, there are plenty of alloy wheel choices too. Now you can't order different rim sizes, but there are four different styles to choose from. And once you've decided on your favorite, you can color coordinate its finish with your chosen paint shade. Now we have uh, satin black finished rims here. On the S model, you can have the brake calipers finished in high gloss black and uh, decorative Creative valve sleeves are available too. There's also a sport design package that gives you a front apron design more similar to that of the previous 991 series model, but which reduces ground clearance. Uh, sport design side skirts can be ordered. You might want to specify rear privacy glass, and you can have the mirrors finished in body color, or you could specify a high gloss black finish for those exterior mirrors, and maybe extend that to the side window trims, the trimming strips, or even the Porsche logo. Uh, you can have the model designation badges in different colors, and maybe also add a decorative Porsche side logo or model specific logo in black, red, silver or a shade the brand calls Aurium. Uh, there are motorsport decorative sticker sets. You can have the rear lid air intake slats painted and the engine compartment lid can be painted in titanium grey. For the roof, a pricey lightweight carbon fibre finish is available or you could add an electric glass sunroof. Inside, there's a wide range of cabin customization options with extras like inlays in brushed aluminium, body color, or even high quality Paldeo wood veneer. You can upgrade the upholstery to a pricier club leather status that's fitted to this particular car in truffle brown. Uh, and you can have the seat center panels in a contrasting color. Two interior trim packages give you decorative stitching, not only on the seats, but also across the fascia, the doors, and the transmission tunnel. Uh, a leather interior package adds extra height on the dashboard, the center console and the door panels. Uh, you can have personalized leather edged floor mats. You can add an embossed finish to the uh, storage compartment that's between the seats. Or you might want to add a leather stitched finish to the sun visors, to the door sill guards, or even the vehicle key or the car's documents folder. The front seat backs can be finished in leather too, with or without decorative inlays, or alternatively in carbon fiber. And there's more. You can uh, specify an Alcantara finish for the roof lining, uh, for the storage compartment between the seats, and for the sun visors. The door sill guards can be finished in carbon or aluminium, with or without illumination. Uh, if you don't like ordinary black seat belts, then they can be specified in brown, as here, or in silver grey, yellow, various reds and greens, or in a shade that Porsche calls crayon. Uh, the face of the rev counter and the Sport Chrono Center Dash stopwatch can be finished in red, yellow, green or white. Uh, we think that the smaller diameter GT Sport steering wheel might be of interest. That's trimmed either in leather, carbon or in Alcantara, with or without matte carbon panels. 
Uh, that wheel and the standard one can also be heated on request. You can have your vehicle key painted and its pouch finished in Alcantara and the transmission lever can be finished in aluminium. Uh, the finishing touch would be the light design package which fills the cabin with dimmable LEDs for unique nighttime ambiance. Practical extras include a roof box, snow chains, all weather floor mats and a luggage compartment liner. Uh, we would ideally want the bespoke Porsche leather luggage set to make the most of the boot space, uh, or at least we would if it didn't cost £4,000. It includes four different sized bags fashioned from high quality stitched leather. And finally, let's tell you about safety provision. Now, last time we tested this car in 2015, we told Porsche it was unacceptable not to have some sort of standard fit autonomous braking system on a car of this price in this day and age. Well, they finally listened and all 992 series 911 models come with the Porsche Active Safe package, which, as you drive, scans the road ahead in search of potential accident hazards. If one's detected, you'll be warned. Uh, if you don't respond, then the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. All well and good, but things have moved on in terms of camera-driven safety tech since 2015, and the 911 doesn't appear to have moved with it. Only two other main camera-driven features are available, and both, rather unforgivably in our view, are on the options list. Lane change assist uh, stops you from dangerously pulling out to overtake if there's a vehicle in your blind spot, and lane keep assist alerts you if you drift out of your lane on the highway, and it'll subtly steer you back to where you ought to be. Now, that package uh, is combined with traffic sign recognition, which reads road signs and then displays them for you on the dash. It can even show bend signs in the instrument cluster to alert you before sharp turns, which is very neat. Uh, Porsche is keen to highlight the addition on the 992 series models of Night View Assist, which uses infrared technology with a range of up to 300 meters ahead to aid nighttime vision. But to be frank, we think that sort of setup is more of a distraction than a safety aid. You might also want to upgrade the optional cruise control system to one featuring radar-driven adaptive technology uh, so your 911 will automatically maintain a safe distance to the car in front at speeds between 18 and 130 miles an hour. What about the uh, basic safety stuff? Well, all mainstream 911 models come with twin front side and curtain airbags integrated as part of the Porsche side impact protection system. Uh, you also get tyre pressure monitoring along with the usual braking aids. And of course, there's the best stability system in the business, PSM, Porsche Stability Management Traction Control, which includes an extra PSM sport setting, which allows the driver to throw the car around a little more without intervention yet keeps the safety net in place should uh, ambition get the better of your talent. Uh, there's also a post-collision braking system that will automatically brake the car after you've hit something and help to prevent it uh, further impacting something else. Isofix child seat mounts are fitted to both rear seats but getting an Isofix fastening fitted to the front passenger seat that'll cost you extra. The 911 has long led its class in terms of running cost efficiency and not much has changed. Uh, as a benchmark to rate this Porsche against, let's take the returns of uh, what is probably this car's closest competitor, the base 482 PS version of the Mercedes-AMG GT Coupe, uh, which manages a WLTP combined cycle best fuel reading of 23 miles per gallon and an NEDC rated CO2 emission showing of 261 grams per kilometre. Other segment rivals, by the way, are nearly all worse than that. Uh, now, in comparison, an equivalently quick 911 Carrera S manages a WLTP figure of up to 28.5 mpg and a CO2 emission stat of 205 grams per kilometre. That's a big difference. Uh, the standard Carrera, by the way, returns exactly the same fuel figure and the CO2 reading a digit worse at 206 grams per kilometre. 
Now, for comparison, we'll also run through the returns of the other Carrera Series models. Uh, they aren't much different. Uh, both the Carrera Cabriolet and the Carrera S Cabriolet return 28 miles per gallon. Uh, the standard drop top pairing that to a 210 grams per kilometer uh, emissions figure, which falls slightly to 208 grams per kilometer for the Carrera S Cabriolet. All wheel drive doesn't hit the figures much either. The Carrera 4S Coupe that we're testing today here uh, manages up to 27.2 mpg on on the WLTP combined cycle and 206 grams per kilometer of NEDC rated CO2. For the equivalent Carrera 4S Cabriolet, the figures are 26.6 mpg and 207 grams per kilometer. As a result, whatever the Carrera series model you choose, the 67 litre fuel tank might easily take you over 500 miles between fill ups. You can't really explain this Porsche's efficiency advantage over its rivals in terms of weight. Uh, now the 911 might once have been a light car, but it no longer is. This 992 series car is actually 55 kilos heavier overall than later equivalent versions of its 991 series predecessor, which means that the well-equipped Carrera series model can easily tip the scales at over 1.7 tonnes. And that's around about the same as an equivalent Mercedes-AMG GT, for example. So it has to be down to engineering and aerodynamics. So let's start with the engineering. Now the twin turbo flat six used in this 992 series model might ostensibly seem to be the same as the unit fitted to the later versions of the previous generation model, but Porsche earnestly tells us that it's been taken apart and heavily redesigned, uh, not just for more power, but also in pursuit of greater efficiency. Now feel free to glaze over as we drill down into the detail of what's changed, but for those of you who do care, uh, we can tell you that the compression has been increased, uh, the charge air cooling system's different, and there are also new piezo injectors to optimize fuel distribution in the combustion chambers too. Uh, a gasoline particulate filter has been installed, and freshly developed lightweight cast manifold and adaptive turbine housings have made it possible to improve the turbo system's airflow conditions. And for the first time, the VarioCam Plus variable valve control system uses asymmetrical intake camshafts and a small valve stroke to control gas exchange. The use of a controlled oil pump and advanced fuel efficient engine oils are further measures that reduce both power losses and improve fuel consumption. We should also mention the PDK Auto gearbox firstly because it can disconnect itself from the drivetrain when you're coasting at cruising speeds to aid efficiency and secondly because it now has new ratios, a shorter first and a longer eighth gear so it's been possible to implement a longer final drive ratio thereby reducing engine speeds in the upper gears. As mentioned earlier aerodynamics are of course also key here. Now there's an awful lot that we could tell you about the way that the bodywork panels and their various appendages have been sculpted to scythe through the air but we're just going to highlight two things as an example. Uh, the now larger active aerodynamic cooling flats in the front apron stay closed until you reach 93 miles an hour ensuring optimum airflow and the redesigned adaptive rear spoiler now has a specific efficiency optimized eco intermediate position for the lowest possible aerodynamic resistance. Want to do better? Well, in the future, 911 owners will probably be able to because room has apparently been left in the PDK Auto Gearbox's bell housing for a hybrid motor. Although quite where the Zuffenhausen engineers will fit the battery, uh, we have absolutely no idea because every inch of this car appears to be filled with stuff. This 911 continues its strong efficiency showing when it comes to questions of routine servicing and maintenance. Uh, there's a wider dealer network than many rivals can offer and you'll only need to visit your local Porsche Centre every two years or every 20,000 miles, whichever comes around soonest. Uh, there's no option to buy into a prepaid servicing package at point of purchase, but the brand does offer a fixed price servicing approach which makes sure that you'll know in advance exactly what what work is going to be carried out and what it's going to cost. Uh, expect to pay in the region around £500 for an intermediate service and around £700 for a full service. Now showboating on track days is going to cost you in rubber wear though. Uh, the bespoke Michelin tyres are fearsomely expensive to replace. 
what else? Um, well, all models are covered by a three-year unlimited mileage warranty package, which is unsurpassed for this type of car. And the 911 also has 12 years of corrosion cover and a three-year paint guarantee. Uh, insurance for a car of this power and performance is never going to be cheap, of course. All Carrera S variants, uh, for instance, attract a top-of-the-shop Group 50 rating. Uh, a typical driver, say a 43-year-old male living in Oxfordshire with three points on his license, could expect an annual premium on a Carrera S of around £1,000. But obviously that figure will vary depending on your driving history, where you live, your age and how many points you have on your license. When you decide to sell on your car, you'll find that this Porsche's heritage and reputation will help to shore up its value. Uh, now we expect the returns of this 992 series uh, to be as good at least as those of later versions of its 991 series predecessor. Uh, to give us some perspective, that older car retained between 57 and 58% of its original value after three years of use, and that's easily a class leading showing. Uh, do bear in mind that depreciation will take a bit of a hit if you load your car up with too many unnecessary pricey extras and few used buyers are going to want a car with manual transmission. The 911, whether you have a classic model or this 8th generation 992 series variant, it's an automotive icon that's globally loved, which is why, although this version has been substantially redesigned, Porsche hasn't messed with the fundamental formula. In other words, if, like us, you've always loved this car, then you'll love this one. There are surely lots of reasons to. The improved six-cylinder twin turbo used in this Carrera series is efficient, yet sonorous and gloriously tractable. Plus, the cabin's more up-to-date and the infotainment's been brought up to scratch. In addition, like its predecessor, this 911 is practical and easy to use. And it remains satisfying to drive in a way that rivals just can't quite match. Of course, with over 50 years of development behind it, you'd expect this car to be impressive. Porsche, though, could still have pleased its loyal buyers with a far milder evolution than this. As it is, it feels like a decent step forward has been taken here. Uh, the technology that caused so much comment with the previous generation version, uh, the electric steering, the turbocharging and so on, now feels a natural part of the 911 proposition. And Porsche has managed to enhance this model's usability, quality and refinement, while at the same time making it a more incisive, better balanced and faster driver's car than its 991 series predecessor ever was. Of course, there are some downsides. Uh, to all intents and purposes, this is now a six-figure sports car, thanks to price hikes and Porsche's insistence that you should spend a fair bit on options if you're going to get the 911 of your dreams. Which would be a greater issue if this contender wasn't so capable of easily challenging super sports cars costing over 25% more? Bigger issues include something inherent in the basic 911 configuration, a lack of boot space, and something that Porsche could and probably should have done something about. And that is the absence of kind of uh, more advanced camera safety and autonomous driving features that you these days find on much cheaper cars. Is all that enough to threaten this model's continued position as the best super sports car in its segment? And Arguably the best sports car of any kind on sale for less than Ferrari money? We'd say not. In summary, what we have here is a worthy evolution of the world's longest running sports car dynasty. Porsche's banking on the fact that the excellence of this 911 will help to simplify the decision over whether to commit to the significant outlay involved in buying it. If over half a century of development has taught us anything, it's that you wouldn't bet against them succeeding in doing just that.